on Christ. He is the solid rock on which we stand. This morning we come to Psalm 56. If you have your outline, go ahead and turn there to the passage of Scripture. And uh, I want to direct your attention to this great little psalm. It's only 13 verses long. You're looking at the entire thing. What is a psalm? A psalm is a song. That's what it is. It's a song. And this particular song uh, is one that is a bit of a lament, even a personal lament. Some some songs of the uh, laments or the the uh, complaint before God. Um, many have called it a song of lament, but it really is should be classified as a psalm of thanksgiving. And you'll see that in a minute um, as we read it and get down to the bottom. And so we will be looking at this great psalm of David um, that really is um, a cloaked song of thanksgiving. This morning, I've entitled the message, In God We Trust, and I'd like to ask you to actively take a pen there and put a question mark after that. In God We Trust. Put a question mark uh, that is there. This morning, as best we can, even though I've titled this, In God We Trust, which is our national motto, you might be tempted to believe that the thrust of this message will be a patriotic call a rally together as a nation and a society around the American identity as a people who traditionally have looked to God um, for strength and help. Um, that's what traditionally, if you saw a sermon entitled In God We Trust, it would be typically um, aimed at the bit of patriotism and the bit of Christ, Judeo-Christian heritage background um, that our country has had. Well, I believe that to one degree or another, um, there's certainly the ideal of this national motto. This is not, this message is not a call to unity under the American flag and even our Christian heritage. Um, no, today is a call to consider whether we have, as a local church family, whether you have, as an individual, a real abiding trust in God as we enter into an extraordinary crisis of unknown earthly outcome. There's no question that we are coming into waters that are rough. It's as if the captain is saying, uh, batten down the hatches, everybody to your stations. We're not sure exactly what is going to happen. But I believe that today that we need to pivot away from the bit of Americana thinking to where am I with God? Where are my thoughts and my feelings? And where is my faith in regards to God? The whole world can be divided into one of two categories. Those who put their trust in God and those who do not. Think about this. From the first two brothers on the earth, what were their names? Cain and Abel. One by faith offered a sacrifice that was pleasing to God. The other did not, and the other murdered. So even from the beginning, we see one with faith and one without. How about this? The, the digital option as a clearly laid out in the first psalm, this the first psalm is saying there is the righteous and there are the unrighteous. All, every man is going to be determined as either being righteous or unrighteous. And we see that as the first psalm of all of the psalms, this digital nature of on or off. Think about this, the symbol of our church is three crosses. You see it everywhere. In fact, the three crosses that are out on Sheridan Street. You see, there's, there's the nature as well there of two criminals being crucified on either side of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And one would receive him and the other would reject him. There is the one of faith and the one without faith. To the response that people are having in this present global crisis today, there are just two responses. And this is the way that it's always been. There's not three, there's not five, there's not seven billion different options for everybody on earth. There's just one of two. 
indeed similar to the underpinnings of the whole digital world of on or off. That's how we can look at either we are trusting and we are looking to God or we are not. So the option is either faith in God or no faith in God. And all of this is based in either having an understanding of the world that comes from God or an understanding of the world that comes from man. Now, we would say this in the life of our church. We've talked about the difference in between a secular worldview that looks at viruses and looks at wars and looks at the joys of life, looks at finances, looks at history, looks at everything through a a secular view. When it comes to things like coronavirus, we can see whether our thinking is of the world or if our thinking is from God. Part of the reason that we would look at the words of God, that we would look at the truths of God, is to help our thinking line up with his word. And that's truly what I hope happens here in the next few minutes, that as we look at this beautiful little psalm, that maybe you will be moved from not having faith in God to having faith in God with this. Shouldn't that be our goal as we gather together? And so there are options. There's always been an option to not trust in God. In Psalm 56, we see an individual, an imperfect individual, who is in a very, very serious situation. He's in the midst of a long, life-threatening ordeal, and he is running for his life. And he jumps out of the cauldron and into the what? Fire. You know what that means? I thought we have English as a second language for a lot of people here. A cauldron is this big thing that's sitting over a fire boiling. And you think, wow, I'm in the cauldron. You know, this trouble around me is pretty bad. And and somebody would be tempted to jump out of the cauldron because, boy, it's going to cook me alive. And But it's bad when you jump out of the cauldron and you jump into the what? It's just as bad or maybe worse. And that's what we see David does. What, why do I say that? We, you'll see this in just a second here. He is having one of those nightmares that he cannot wake up from. And the reason he can't wake up from it is because he's already awake. Have you ever had a nightmare that you're just you're, you're trying so hard to wake up and you can't seem to wake up? How many of you like those? Oh, my goodness. No one. We hate that. I mean, and, and yet occasionally that happens. Well, for David, it's real. He's being chased by somebody who wants to kill him. And he jumps from the person who wants to kill him out of his path into the path of a sworn enemy and an enemy that is known for torturing people. So Saul just wanted to kill him, but the Philippians would have done more if they could. The Philippians, the Philistines... Uh, not the poor Philippians, no, the Philistines <laughs> with there. Notice the title there on your outline. Look what it says. To the choir master, according to the dove of far off Tenebrates. And then look at the second line. A midtown of David when the Philistines, Philistines seized him in Gath. Right out there to the side, 1 Samuel 21, 10 through 15. 1 Samuel 21 verses 10 through 15. If you read in the book of Samuel, you'll find where this psalm comes from. You'll find the settings around which David wrote this song. And so if we go back and we look at that, we see that in his young life, we see that Saul becomes the king of Israel. Listen to this. His leadership, first king. The people said, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. So they anoint Saul as king. His leadership is disastrous. And the people greatly suffer under his leadership. And Samuel privately anoints the shepherd boy, David, to be the next king. Young David faces a giant, the Philistine giant, named Goliath. And he kills Goliath. David becomes Saul's enemy eventually. And so the king is after David, and David is on the run with a whole army pursuing him. You can read all about that in 1 Samuel verses chapters 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 
And then we come to where he runs across the border and he runs to another place, out to Gath, and he is suddenly in the midst of the enemy. And the enemy starts to discover who he is. And he comes before their king and he is so terrified that they're just going to kill him outright. He begins to slobber and drool and, and rage around like a madman so that they believe he's totally insane. So David very quickly adapts to his very hostile situation and trying to preserve his life. He acts like a crazy madman. And the king says, what if you brought this idiot before me? David was a pretty adaptable guy, as you can see there, thinking quickly on his feet. So David's problem really isn't a virus that may kill him, but a nightmare that he cannot wake up from because it's real. And it's chalked full of deathly danger all around him. Here's the thing for us to recognize. Everyone has trouble. Everyone has danger. In David's day to our day, for some, the trouble they experience is merely annoying or concerning. For others, it is long and painful. And for others, it is sometimes catastrophic and even physically life-threatening. This morning, we focus, however, though, not on the nature of the trouble from Psalm 56, even though I want you to understand the background of it, but we want to focus as we read this on the nature of the response to the trouble because there we can find some gold for us today. So notice with me, Psalm 56 here we see the expose of a man's response to a very terrifying, life-threatening, horrifying set of circumstances. To us, our trouble may be coronavirus this year, but it's always something. Uh, one of you as a church member sent me this statement uh, this week. In 2001, it was anthrax. In 2002, it was West Nile. Remember West Nile? Get bit by a mosquito and have this terrible... In 2003, it was SARS. It's going to kill us all. In 2005, it was bird flu. In 2006, it was E. coli and a flesh-eating virus. In 2008, it was financial collapse. We're all going to eat each other. In 2009, it was swine flu. In 2012, it was the Mayan calendar that predicted the end of the world. In 2013, it was North Korea, with whatever his name is, that was going to start World War III. In 2014, it was Ebola virus. In 2015, it was ISIS taking over a new caliphate. In 2016, it was Zika virus right here close to home. And in 2020, it's coronavirus. Now, this statement says, the truth is fear is killing you. Turn off the TV, pray, trust God, and wash your hands. It's a good word. You see, if it's not viruses or financial collapse or terrorists, perhaps it's any number of things that are your big concerns. Perhaps it's your health, maybe corona-related or not. Maybe it's another health issue. When I used to go in this building day after day and in that building day after day, when I was a student here as a young boy, it was the constant concern about grades and the man whose office was in that building, which was my dad. I was always concerned about that. I was concerned about the next new demerit that was going to land me in his office. Maybe for some, it's friends. The great concern about what, what, who are my friends and, and are, they, are they real and what's going to happen with them and am I, am I going to be embarrassed or am I going to have friends? Thinking about the young years, maybe fast forward just a little bit, maybe for some a young man or a young woman, it's my future. What does my future hold? I remember when that used to bring fear to me. What about finding a mate? For those who say, I don't want to make a mistake in this and I want to be married. Will God provide the right mate? Who will it be? And 
will I be in the right place and will I pursue what is right? This, for some, it's a, it's a fear. Or maybe for those of you who have a mate, it's your marriage. Sometimes that can bring the greatest amount of fear. Or perhaps it's our children. If not their health, then maybe their life and how they are going to live. Or maybe it's your career. You see, we all have issues that we often struggle with being afraid. For some, it may be fear of death. Perhaps how your death will come or if death, lo death looms pain or uncertainty of note of loneliness and you come to that you see any one of these things can be like a pursuing enemy that David was dealing with it can cause fear to rise up within us or it can be a global pandemic of the Ebola virus right here experienced in South Florida it's the thing that causes us to be fearful because of unknown circumstances let's look very quickly at a few things here very quickly as we go. The first thing I want you to see is look what it says in verse 1. He says, be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. Two things I want you to notice. Put a big arrow out to the right-hand side of the first line and just put out there the words, the right cry. What is the right cry that we see here in this? Underline it. It says, be gracious to me, O God. That's the right cry when trouble comes. Oh, dear God, have mercy upon me. It's the right thing not to yell at the enemy and not to yell in fear and in hardship of yourself or the circumstance. The right thing is to immediately turn to God and say, God, have mercy upon me. You see, this is the expression of faith from the start. Look at the next part that is here. For man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. We see the repeating nature of a poem that is here. Put out there to the side not only the real cry, or the, excuse me, the right cry, but the real trouble. You know, the Bible is so wonderful in that it deals honestly with our circumstances. It doesn't act like everything's fine. The Bible deals with the pain of life. God deals with us in pain of life. And in fact, he has taken a fallen world that has run from him and is experiencing an ongoing death that comes from sin. And he is using that to turn our hearts to him. And he is blessed and he is honored and he is glorified when we choose to look and to listen at what he has said and to believe in him instead of sitting in our fallen circumstances. So there's a very real trouble. I've underlined this next verse for you, and I want you to put a big circle around this because to me, this is one of my favorite verses of the Bible. I love it. Look what it says in verse 3. When I am afraid. I put my trust in you. You see, the reality is sometimes we are afraid. The reality is we have pain that hurts and we have circumstances that are unknown. And there are certain things that may happen that we don't want to happen. And those can cause us to fear. But here we see in Psalm 56, verse 3, David's right response. Fill that out. Put the arrow out there to the side. Point to David's right response in verse 3. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Everybody has fears. We've mentioned those a lot. I, when I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but remember. Do you remember that guy, Indiana Jones? He had the coolest hat. He had the coolest whip. He had the coolest clothes. And he was a professor that would travel all around the world as an archaeologist. And he would brave storms, he would brave little airplanes, he would brave temples with booby traps all through them. He'd go creeping through. There was, there was nothing. He seemed to even tarantulas on his back or around him. He's just brushing those off. He, he's doing great. He just doesn't seem to be afraid of anything until it came to what? Remember the line? Snakes. 
I hate snakes. You know, we've all got snakes. We've all got things that we're afraid of. We've all got a certain thing that really gets us. And I want us to see tonight or this morning that this is part of the reality of life that David acknowledges. And he says, when I am afraid, I do one thing. I put my trust in you. Verse four, look what it says. In God, circle this, whose word, the word word, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? That's a question that he asks. And this whole thing is repeated again down in verse 11. Look at the end of verse 11. You see it again. What can man do to me? It's this question. When it says flesh, the idea is humanity. What can something from this earthly life do to me when I am a truster in God? That he is beyond this life. And he calls me to go with him beyond this life. In all of eternity, these little short 70, 80, 90 years, very short. And yet he calls us to live in eternity beyond this. What can flesh do to the savior of my soul? Another thing that I would have you put a note out there on verse four is this. God cannot be separated from his word. And we see that in verse 4. He says, I put my trust in you. In verse 4 it says, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. So God says things, and he always says that which is true. And listen to this. He always delivers on his promises. He never misses a promise. And he calls us to believe him. And so we bless him the most when we believe what he said. In fact, in Hebrews, it tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so we see that faith is a big deal to God. Faith is, faith, faith is something that he wants us to have. Faith is something, in fact, that he, in, in his goodness and his kindness, he gives us faith. And he calls us to grow in faith. That he gives us. Notice the next part as we go. Verse 5. All day long they injure my cause. You see going back to the problem. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps. As they have waited for my life. What are they waiting for his life for? What are, what are they doing? They're waiting to take it. They're coming after him. Verse 7, for their crime will they escape in wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. Go on to verse 8. You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Now, he is saying this to God. He's saying, Lord, you've noticed all the times I'm turning on my bed. Now, what, what happens when you're talking about tossing on the bed? What is going on there? Are you asleep? Not typically. If you're asleep at all, you're restless, right? You're easily woken up. And when you woke up, wake up, that snake is on your mind, right? The problem is on your mind. And here we see that, you know, when danger is around, we, we're not going to sleep well. When we're nervous about something, we don't sleep well. Or we don't sleep at all. Look what it says next. You have kept count of my tossings. The next one, you put my tears in your bottle. The scripture talks about the fact that God sees all of our tears and all of our sorrows. He, what is this is saying is he knows and cares about our pain. Sometimes we're tempted to believe that, oh no, God doesn't really see or know or care about my trouble. And especially since I'm such a sinner, I blew it again. God is punishing me. You see, that's, that's worldview that comes from the world. 
But when we come to see salvation by grace through faith in Christ, and we see the sonship that God gives us, we begin to see the grace that is poured out that even through the trouble, and yes, even through our sinful, foolish hearts that still dishonor him, God is working his grace in his children's lives, and they have nothing to fear. This is a glorious truth. Here we see that God cares about our hearts. He hears our cry. Look at this at the end of verse 8. Are they not in your book? Now, what does that mean? What book? The idea is that God has a book. God has a book about all of the circumstances of our life. He knows all about it. Now, I, I think that this is all part of God's perfect memory. And not only his perfect memory, but listen, his perfect game plan. All of the days of our lives are numbered. All of the circumstances of this. God has done all things to bring about glory for himself. And we are discovering what that is. And somehow in his cosmic way, he is causing his sovereign will and our will to come into conformity with that. And he is glorified as we experience and walk in faith in all of this. And so he has a plan. It's a beautiful thing. He, he knows about all of our struggle and all of our trouble. So, no, here's the thing. Out there to the side, your big arrow, go out there to the side and write the right advocate. You have the right advocate with God. <clears throat> He's the right advocate because he cares, number one. And also, two, he has the power to act. He has the power to deal with you. He has the power to deal with your circumstance. Listen, he has the power to deal with your enemies. We have to keep moving. Notice this next one here. Verse 9. Verse 9 really goes along with that. Then my enemies will turn back. And in the day when I call, this I know. Look what it says. That God is for me. You see, God is always for his children. He loves his children. And he's going to see his children through. That's why you really need to think about whether or not you're one of his children. That's why a crisis like this can cause people to come up for air out of the, the world that we live in. The fact that we need to look to God. We need to listen to God. We need to say, what is he saying to me? There's people in this crowd that this coronavirus may be the best thing that has ever happened in your life. If it causes you to be here today, look to God and to believe. And I don't mean just believe that God is like a tree or something like that, that we exist. It, it, the Satans believe all of that. The, the demons believe all of that. To believe that he is the Messiah, the only hope for you, that he died on the cross to redeem your soul from yourself and all of your millions of sin and to redeem you from the consequences of being separated from God. You think coronavirus is bad? It can get a whole lot worse. Friends, coronavirus may be one of the greatest mercies, showing the power of God, showing the need, showing the ultimate consequences of sin in a fallen world where God is calling people to turn to him and to believe in him and to trust in him. And that all happens through the cross. And we come to recognize that he loves us so much that he would lay down his life. That's why at the end of verse 9 it says, this I know that God is for me. How do you know that God is for you? Just look at the cross. He came and he died for you. And if he'll die for you, he will take you safely home to heaven. Man, I love Psalm 56. Notice the next part here. Look at in verse 10. We see a repeat again here. From up in verse 4, look in verse 10. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise. Again, that idea that, that God cannot be separated from his word. You can trust his word, what he says he will do. You see, this is the right source of your info. Put that big line out there to the side. This is the right source of my information. Pastor Lucas spoke earlier about all the news that's on. All the news. All the news. News, 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 news. News everywhere. News from China and Asia and Europe. News, news everywhere. News all across the United States. 
so many different opinions, so many different agendas, so many different points of view that have to do with worldview, the way they view the world, the, the interpretation, the filter by which they interpret what is happening. You know, the world isn't the right place to get the information because man doesn't know. Humanity does not know a lot of things. I mean, here we have all of these nations with all of this technology, and we get caught flat-footed with something like yet a new virus. Oh, there were some who were warning that this would happen for years. I look back at old issues of The Economist magazine. Bill Gates has been talking about this, this likelihood for over a decade. He's been saying, I don't worry about terrorists. I don't worry about computer viruses. I worry about biologics that will come along, that will affect us all. I worry about the next pandemic. Friends, the world is not the place to get our information in everything. The ultimate information that we need, the most important information that we need is from the word of God. And that's why you and that's why I need to be in the word of God. We need to come to know it. We need to read it. So you say, well, I read it and I don't understand. Just keep reading. If you just keep reading, you'll start to understand. You just keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. It's amazing to me that people who spend their lives in the word of God come to understand it. I met with a lady this week who's um, considering becoming a member of our church. And she told, her, told me her testimony of, being, of living over 45 years in active rebellion against God in every way. She said, Pastor, if there was a picture in the encyclopedia of a demon, it would be this face right here. I was lost in drugs and alcohol in every way imaginable. Every aspect of rejection of God, of embracing the world. She said, I don't even remember most of my life. Because I spent it high. And I spent it. I, I can remember certain events, but I can't give you any time frame. But you know what her testimony was? Her testimony was this. That God came and brought faith into her heart. And five years ago, just five years ago, she began reading the Bible. She said, I couldn't get enough. I started reading the Bible and reading the Bible. And I would listen on the radio program. And at first I was listening and watching Daystar and some of these things, and I started to realize, wait a minute, that's not true. That, that's not true. She said, the more I read the Bible, I started to know who to listen to. And eventually, she she just continued to that. And I, it was so great. I said to Pastor Jay, I went and I said, wait just a minute. I went and I found Pastor Jay, and I found Pastor Lucas, and I said, you got to hear this lady's testimony. Amen. She, she just immersed herself in the Bible. And now when she talks, she kind of views everything she's dealing with through scripture. I mean, when I was talking, she'd go, oh, yeah, that's, um, you know, Ezekiel 7, 5. Oh, yeah, that's, um, she, she's just thinking in terms, she said, I don't know anything else. In fact, I said to her, I said, you know, it's amazing that for doing drugs for 40 years, that God has preserved your cognitive ability. And she was kind of like, what's that? <laughs> and... I said, your ability to really think. And she said, I don't know anything except the word of God. Friends, you don't need to know anything ultimately except the word of God. Yet we spend so much time wondering what the next new word is of the virus, right? We spend the, so much time looking at the thinking of men when we need to recognize the eternal truths of God. So look at verse 10. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise. Look at verse 11. Let's read it out loud together. Top line, verse 11. In God, I trust. I shall not be afraid. Okay, we're going to have to do that again. Are you ready? Clear your throat. Here we go. Verse 11. In God, I trust. I shall not be afraid. You see, this is that picture again of when I am afraid, I'm going to trust in God. Well, wait a minute. No, the progression of this is, is that I trust God and I don't have to be afraid. You see, the song is a progression of this. Many of the Psalms do. And then he asks the question again, what can man 
do to me. You see, this is, put a line out there to the side, the right perspective. This is the right perspective. We have the right source of information, verse 10. We have the right perspective in verse 11. Now, in verse 12, we're going to see the right action. Here comes the right action. Look what it says in verse 12. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. Now, there's two things that are here. He's saying, first, I must perform my vows. This is, I'm going to act upon my vows. A vow is a word. So we're, we're just going to notice the, the way it goes here. God's word comes to us so that we can believe. We believe, and God invites us to make words back to him of belief. And so he says, believe in me. We say, I believe in you. And now he says, so prove it. Don't be saved by your works. Simply let your works prove that you're mine. That you really believe what you say that you believe. And this is where, this is very important for us now. Because it's the way we live and it's what we think and it's what we do over these next few weeks, next few months are a tremendous opportunity to either show our faith in God or to reveal our lack of faith in God. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're going to say, oh, well, I'm going to show my faith in God. I'm going to go get somebody with coronavirus to cough on my face, and I, I'm going to show that I am immune from this. You say, that's utterly foolish. Of course it is. We're not talking about testing God in this way. We're talking about proving God in the fact that he knows the need of my heart. He knows the need of my life. And I'm going to trust him even with these fallen circumstances, even with something as hideous as coronavirus. We are called with our vows, our words, to perform them, to act on them. And how does it end up? Look at the end of verse 12. I will render thank offerings to you. This is by faith, giving thanks to God for his goodness and giving thanks to God for his promises. You know, it's an attitude of gratitude. That's the picture. I believe that people who have their faith in God are thankful people. People who really are saved are people who are grateful. If you find someone who is not at all grateful, they really struggle with gratefulness in their life, I think it's a valid thing for you to ask, do I really know the Lord? Because if he has saved you from your sin, oh, the glorious nature of his salvation for you. You see, this is, and it all leads to, not I'm choosing not the word right, but right out there to the side of verse 13, the ultimate deliverance. The ultimate deliverance. Notice in verse 13. For you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling. Here we see the real perspective. That I may walk before God in the light of life. This is the ultimate deliverance. This is what right out there to the side. John eleven twenty five. John eleven twenty five. 25, when Jesus is there with, with the brother of, of Lazarus, or excuse me, the sisters of Lazarus, and Lazarus has died, and Jesus says to them, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You see, the, the physical life here is not the issue. It's the eternal life of God's grand plan. Oh, friends, the ultimate deliverance. And when we see this, notice the last phrase there, that I may walk before God in the light of life. This comes from Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53 and verse 11, we see this, or it, or it doesn't come from that. Isaiah 53, 11 reflects this. And this is where it comes from. The, the Messiah, after, listen to this, after he has suffered, he will see the light of light and be satisfied. So this is the ultimate salvation of the Messiah. That is what David is talking about. Um, what a beautiful thing that we can come and celebrate the life of Christ. 
So really, is it your confession that you are trusting in Jesus? Is that right? Praise the Lord. You'll live for him all days of your life and your existence. Praise God. You may be seated by the church. With me in just a moment, I'm going to lay you back in the water. And as I do that, I'm going to say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and you baptize because it is God, the triune God, who came and sent his son to die for our sin by his spirit we believe. And then it's by his love that we believe. And so that is what we represent. Just as Jesus was laid in the tomb no more sins, he was raised to overcome that by his life. It is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried, you are buried in the baptism. Praise God. Praise God.